Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, this whole school send. Welcome to this whole school send webinar. Um, my name is Matt MacArthur. I'm one of the deputy regional send leads for uh, for whole school send for the South Central England and Northwest London region. Uh, with us today, we will also have my colleagues on the regional team, uh, Becky Jones and Catherine Walsh. Um, and we're absolutely delighted today to have with us Gary Orbin and Dr. Calvin Atwell uh, this afternoon. Gary is here in his role as content specialist for SEND at the Education and Endowment Foundation. And Calvin is here in his role as head teacher of two large East London primary schools. We also have Jenny on the line too, you should see her there from Whole School Send providing some technical support. For those of you who haven't worked with us before, uh, Whole School Send Consortium brings together schools and organisations and individuals who are committed to ensuring that every child and young person with SEND can achieve their potential at school. So we're committed to improving outcomes for children and young people and we firmly believe this can be done best through networking and collaborating and unlocking answers that already exist within the system. We're currently delivering the Department for Education's strategic support to the workforce in mainstream and special schools contract, which is run from 2018 uh, up to 2022. So these are our year four contract aims that you can see on the screen uh, before you. Last year, we delivered 154 CPD events uh, like this one, and that was attended by more than 11,000 professionals. So I'd like to give you a bit of an overview of the, the three webinars in this three part series. And I want you to see how these webinars have been designed to follow on and to build on each other. So in this session, Gary is going to explore how SENCOs and school leaders can develop an effective CPD programme for SEND, uh, making use of principles outlined in the new Effective Professional Development Guidance Report. Uh, and that's in order, to, in order to promote what has been proven to be high quality teaching and learning strategies for all learners, but especially learners with SEND. This is then going to be followed by a case study, a school case study, which Colvin is going to present to us. In session two, in a few weeks time, on the 17th of February, Colvin then is going to explore how we can develop a dynamic learning community um, in which there is this self-sustaining culture uh, of, uh, of shared expertise and of collective responsibility for learners with SEND. And again, that will be followed by a case study, um, which Dr. Matt Silver is going to present. And then finally, in session three on the 10th of March, Matt Silver will then explore what we need to learn about ourselves and about others uh, in order to proactively coach individuals and groups towards meaningfully engaging with new evidence-informed, more inclusive practices. Uh, that's then going to be followed by a panel uh, in which, uh, which we will all share our own experiences and insights into that process. Um, and we're also going to explore and take questions, I hope, on what is going to be the golden thread that, that runs through this whole series. Um, and that golden thread is, is, is preparing SENCOs and inclusion leads and school leaders to lead teachers in their professional development um, towards more inclusive practices through that distributed leadership of SENT, in which there is that shared expertise, that collective responsibility across the whole school, not just siloed in certain pockets or, or with the SENCO. So without anything further, I'm going to hand you over to Gary Orbin um, from the Education Endowment Foundation. So I shall stop sharing my screen. Uh, and I'll invite uh, Gary to share his. Well, Gary, Thank you very much, Matt. <laughs> I've successfully unmuted. So that's the first step there. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Gary Orbin. So um, 
three days a week, I lead send provision for a multi academy trust, and then two days a week, I work for the Education Endowment Foundation as their content specialist for send, which means I try and get as many schools and senkos and school leaders and teachers and TAs. I try to support them to understand what the evidence is around send and then um, help them to implement it into their um, into what they do in schools, ultimately for the, for the benefit of, um, of students. And in my session today, I'd really like to talk about the, um, a bit about the SEN in mainstream guidance report, and about if you looked at that, how might you lead an effective professional development programme around a section of that? Um, and then, and then and, and so actually to, to make it very useful for you as SENCOs and school leaders to be thinking, how can I um, lead a successful um, PD programme in my school relevant to supporting and improving SEND outcomes? Just very quickly, introduction to the Education Endowment Foundation. They are trying to um, improve school for students from disadvantaged backgrounds, particularly, and looking at the use of evidence as a tool to do that. And that's because, as we know, the disadvantage gap grows, doesn't shrink as students go through school, and that we all have a responsibility to try and change this. Um, uh, but the EEF doesn't pretend that it's only um, evidence that makes the difference here. It's got to be evidence from um, real uh, classroom settings, but backed up by professional expertise. Evidence on its own doesn't work. It's got to be supported by professionals who are doing a great job and working hard for, for the students to lead to evidence-informed practice. <clears throat> That's our CEO, Becky Francis, and she talks about really how the purpose of what the e EF does must be about being accessible, not sort of research that sits in stuffy academic papers, but is really applicable, practicable, and easy for, for busy school leaders and teachers and senkos to pick up and to implement in their setting. I'll talk um, through two reports really today um, in hopefully a more lively way than that makes it sound. Um, and just to highlight, they're both on the EEF website. The SEN in mainstream schools um, guidance report came out in March 2020. And with hindsight, what a terrible time to release such a report because everyone's closing their schools and making other plans. Um, but that's when that came out. And the other one is the effective professional development guidance report. And so what the EEF do here is take existing research. They work with the university who um, put that research together that it's reduced into a series of really sort of practicable recommendations and that hopefully it um, supports schools to be evidence informed in what they do. So I'll, in what I say today, we'll be, be guided by both of these guidance reports, which are both on the EEF website, if you'd like to look off, uh, to take a look afterwards. So let's talk through <clears throat> CPD as a Senko, and I'd like you to imagine which of these three scenarios, if any, are familiar to you. So Scenario one is as a Senko or Send Leader, I appreciate I'm talking to a, a wide audience perhaps, in September you are given 20 minutes, half an hour, maybe even an hour to talk to the whole school or maybe the whole school except middle leaders because they're off on a different meeting or, or some of the school anyway for 20 minutes at least on everything they need to know about Send in your school and that's your 20 minutes, half an hour in an inset day in September. And that's it, not revisited until perhaps the following September, or at least until February, March or something. So that's scenario one. Not, I make it sound farcical, I think, but but clearly it isn't up in there myself. Scenario two, you don't even really get that. It's done over email. Here you go, here are loads of strategies. And then Senko, I'll leave you, as teachers, I'll leave you to do the rest, to make, to think about how you can implement them in a really impactful, meaningful way that has that balance of personalized personalization where it needs to be something that's very bespoke to a child and whole class inclusive practices which i think we all know are much more um uh, easy to implement than trying to think about strategies for seven or eight different children all of which are different actually the more we can do at the whole class level the better but if, unless we guide teachers of course that becomes impossible so that's scenario two where we do it over email and again i'm a bit flippant but i do work with senkos who have said to me you know, when I, when I ask how something's going, are teachers doing this in your classes? They say, well, I've emailed it out. And of course, I think we all know that emails go into the ether. Emails play a part. But they're clearly not the whole story. But maybe that's all you're given to work with. So that's scenario two is do it over email. Or scenario three. This image to me represents day one of um, inset uh, of CPD in September. The teaching and learning lead stands up in front of the school and says, these are our teaching and learning priorities. This is how we're going to teach this year. And then day two of, of CPD in September, the Senko stands up and says, these are our SEND priorities. This is how, how I'd like you to teach this year. 
And sometimes those two don't go hand in hand and actually they, they fight against each other a bit. So effective CPD is going to be much less effective if it doesn't align with the whole school priorities. So I just wanted to start by you reflecting on that in your setting and go, are one of these a slightly exaggerated version of what you get access to in your school and what might an effective professional development program look like in regards to SEND? So the first thing to, to consider clearly is what might you want to change in your school in terms of SEND, in terms of SEND provision. Now, there may well be a long list. Part of the battle might be going, um, uh, actually, let's reduce it to manageable bits of change. Or part of it might be about getting a bit of objectivity and, and, and finding out from other stakeholders what they think is the change. So you're not just working on your own sort of subjective assumptions, perhaps. But the first step is clearly working out what you want to change. And there are some wonderful tools to help you work out what you want to change. And the, the first many of you will know by virtue of being here, the, um, the review guides from Whole School Send are absolutely wonderful for helping to see what change do I need to make? And you might not do that process yourself. You might engage a range of stakeholders in that process so that you're working with a range of views. And then also in terms of what you want to change, the SEN in mainstream guidance report from the EEF has five evidence informed recommendations, which I'll go through quickly in a moment so that you can make sure that what you want to change and the change you want to make in your school isn't just on a hunch. There is it that's supported by evidence around what good change looks like. Um, these are the five recommendations in the EEF SEN and mainstream guidance report. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll zip over this slide because it, um, but, but this poster exists. If you're looking just to, maybe you know this, you're looking to share with colleagues a sort of bite size um, uh, thing that might inform a nice department meeting or something. This is on the EEF website. Number one, then, and I'm, I'll go through this very quickly, but it's really just to sort of get the cogs going on what the most appropriate bit of change might be in your school. So it could be about the whole school positive environment. So then for you as a SEND leader, you'd be thinking, well, does our data suggest that students with SEND are, are supported and included? Whether do they come to school, do they get excluded? Lots, um, lots of that kind of thing. Do behaviour systems work in a way that says that we support and provide for all positively? Do people and parent voice reinforce that view that actually pupils are supported and included and for positive about school? And then, are your staff, is there an issue that you need to sort of hearts and minds with staff? And is that a good, the most urgent bit of um, professional development you need to lead in your school? Something around um, convincing um, staff potentially, or some staff, that actually inclusion is the right mindset, morally and in the eyes of the law, that this is, this is what your school should be doing. The second recommendation, forgive me for going through these quite quickly, but I want to get to actually what would a PD programme look like here. Um, and the second recommendation is about understanding pupils and their needs. So you might think, if you're thinking, is this an appropriate sort of um, a priority for us in our school? Well, you might think, actually, do we understand the pupils' needs in our school? And do I just know them myself or do I share them well in a way that is accessible easily, jargon-free and meaningful for busy teachers? Um, do we understand pupils' needs as changing or fixed? Actually, pupils' needs do change, don't they? And when we talk about adaptive teaching, responsive teaching, we should be thinking about actually where are they now and what help do they need now rather than this is fixed and, and what they will always struggle with. And then finally, as a reflection question here, um, do teachers work in that assess, plan, do, review cycle that they should be? I think they're always thinking where are they now and what help is needed now and always reviewing that and having reassessment. Recommendation three is about high quality teaching, which for me is the absolute sort of golden ticket of SEND provision, isn't it? It's all good. Some are doing really well in two intervention slots a week, but actually if they can do well and be supported well, six lessons a day, every day, that's clearly the thing that's going to make the greatest difference. So actually the reflection questions, if you're thinking, is this a priority? Then you might be thinking, well, what messages are given about SEND and teaching and learning? Is it that CPD struggle where the teaching and learning lead says one thing and I say another. Are TAs included in relevant training about what good teaching and learning is? Um, do what you're saying about teaching and learning, does that match the evidence? And five evidence-based teaching approaches are in the um, SEN and Mainstream Guidance Report. Again, uh, they're all on the EEF website and I'd love for some of you to have a look. Um, but actually what you're saying about good teaching, does that match the evidence? More on that and on. Um, recommendation four is about interventions and I'm going to skip over that one if I may just for the sake of um, haste but that's all, again all on the website. You could be thinking we really need to sort our interventions here or you might be thinking 
our work with teaching assistants needs to be a bit more evidence informed. I think there's a lot of evidence out there about effective deployment of TAs. And, um, and you may think, right, this is what we need to crack. TA, uh, sorry, CPD aimed at our TAs, but also aimed at teachers and their deployment of TAs, of course. So again, skipping over this one slightly apologetically, so we can come back to number three, which I've sort of put my neck on the line and said, I believe is the most important one. So what the, the SEN and mainstream guidance report says is that essentially, or to a good extent, good teaching for SEN is good teaching for all. And I think many SENCO sort of have known this for years, haven't they? And others are sort of caught up in a couple of aspects of cognitive science that tell us what we, we as SEN leaders knew already, perhaps. But it's not about a magic bullet. It's not about, I found this whizzy new strategy, let's all go and do it. Actually, it's often the answers are often within the strategies that teachers already possess. And this this guidance report, this looked at 38 meta analyses of what good teaching is for students with SEND. Each meta analysis looks at dozens of studies. So we're looking at hundreds of studies and what teaching approaches help students with SEND to make progress. And it found these five in particular. And I've just I've just paused for a moment, partly to have a sip of tea and partly so you can see what I mean by each of these five. So these are the five approaches where, um, and, and, and I do, I will get on to explicit what does a good professional development program look like in a second, but I just, um, just indulge me please for a moment on what um, good teaching is around SEND according to the evidence. And I hope what you see here is it's not rocket science. People often don't need to have a master's in speech and language needs or be a qualified autism, outreach, autism teacher in order to do these things. And if they did, we'd all be in trouble, wouldn't we? Because we need thousands of teachers to be able to, to take these on and do this day to day. Luckily, perhaps the evidence suggests that these are often things that teachers can be expected to do or will be doing already. OK, so this might be the change that you're identifying as this is a thing I want to, to, to change in my school. Um, now, one way to do that would be to talk to your teachers with a series of questions, reflection questions. So each of those five evidence based approaches are split into a series of two or three questions. I'll just read the first one. Do I use clear and succinct language in my teaching? checking pupils understanding frequently that's that feels easy that feels manageable for teachers so actually and i'll come to this as a mechanism in a moment we're trying to do we're trying to allow teachers to succeed rather than going right two and a half hours on autism you need to know all of it if you're going to help johnny in your three which isn't I, I would argue is a problematic approach because it's about the headspace that teachers have when they have um they might have in secondary might teach 9 10 11 classes if they're let's say an art teacher at key stage three there's a limit to how much people can take on. So this is quite good for going, what can I do at the whole class level that the ev be evidence informed and would meet lots of needs? It would, it talks, one of those is about explicit instruction. So in terms of good professional development, you might go, let's look at Rosenshine's explicit instruction and then think about how it links to send. It's not the whole answer. We don't just give out this and go, there you go. It takes nuance. It takes thought about how to apply it for students to send, but we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We go, OK, how do these 10 steps that look pretty good on paper for students who struggle with their learning or need a bit more help? Um, actually, this can work quite well with the Senko support. And I go back to scenario three earlier where the teaching and learning lead and the um, Senko are working against each other rather than with each other. And actually, if you can work with the teaching and learning lead on good teaching practice and help to have a voice to think about what that looks like for SEND and what the nuance is, then that's a potentially really good um, model for professional development. I won't go through all these steps at the moment. That would be um, me going um, off piece a little bit too much. This is about metacognition. One of those five evidence-based approaches was cognitive and metacognitive strategies. And actually, though this is sort of it's far too much text on this slide, I apologise. I won't leave it up long enough for you to read it, but it just emphasises that metacognition is proven to be a good bet for students with SEND. And if we can help our students with SEND think about the process of learning, the process of their thinking, then that's going to be a use it's more likely to be a useful thing that helps students with send make progress as well as other students so we don't have to do something totally different for students with send we just need to think and this is backed up by evidence we just need to think what does that look like what extra element of metacognition can i do or how shall i vary it slightly for a child with need perhaps um just to signpost a couple of things on the eef website each of those five i sort of i hope i have a good fairly good working understanding of what those five are 
but if you if you don't or if you're working with colleagues or don't, who don't there's a nice neat poster that you might use as an email it around or it might be a pre-reading to a training you're giving or something um that's that's gone up last week on the eef website and likewise a reflection tool that goes alongside it that's gone on the eef website um hot off the press today and might be something that you you lead a staff training within a particular department phase within the whole school to to ask people to reflect on how well or how consistently they do those things okay so i've been promising to talk properly about professional development and i shall do so now so let's imagine you are ready to lead a professional development program in your school and what i mean by that is you've identified the change you'd like to see and really everything i've talked about so far is thinking about what is the change that you want to see in your setting and for the example i'm giving here is greater implementation of evidence-based teaching approach approaches that support students with send. I want to get the teaching better in my school, essentially. Okay, that might be the change that you want to see. If it isn't, I respect that totally. Please forgive me through use for using this as a, a bit of an example. You then, the next step would be to make sure that the change has a good evidence base to support it, that you're not trying to bring in learning styles, this brand new whizzy thing for which the evidence base doesn't support it as a meaningful thing to be doing for school. So you make sure that whatever the change you want to do in school, actually there's a good evidence base that this is a good thing to be doing. And you might look at some evidence, um, uh, some sort of independent and external evidence to check that that's the case. You then align this change with something that's a priority in your school. So I've talked about fight, you know, working on your own, flying the flag, flag for send on your own, um, and maybe even in the opposite direction to the head teacher or the teaching and learning lead. And actually, then you're much less likely to get traction on this, aren't you? Um, you're much less, much more likely to come across across blocks. And so, what you need to to do has to have sort of agreement generally from your from your head teacher. So, for example, you might look at the school improvement plan, think about, oh, well, actually, our head teacher wants more evidence informed teaching approaches and um, wants outcomes with SEND to be improved. So actually, there's a really nice overlap there that's going to help when I'm trying to fight for CPD time or to be involved in subject reviews, learning walks, whatever it is. And then you, you've thought about the stakeholders who are going to champion that change with you. Clearly, you cannot do it on your own. You need you need um, you need colleagues. You need other people at all levels to be get, able to go. This is a good bit of change. So that might be that might be all kinds of people, but um, it will include people at the top of your school in that um, in that power uh, in that hierarchy. If that is how your school works, so I would consider if you've gone through those four steps, you are ready to deliver an effective professional development program. But what does that look like? And I think we've all, and I certainly have, stood in front of a um, stood in front of a, um, a room full of teachers and teaching assistants in September and gone right. This is the thing, and then everyone's forgotten about it, probably including me by you know general speaking generously by November. Um, and actually, it's not an effective thing to change behaviour. Behaviour can be really hard to change. I think we all know. And as senkos or people involved in sen leadership. You can feel you are banging your head up against a brick wall often. So what would an effective professional development program look like? OK, so this came out from the EEF um, in about September, I think, perhaps October. I'll pause for a moment just to let you look at these three recommendations before I just work to unpick each of them. So it talks about mechanisms. I'll unpick what those are in a moment. It says that those mechanisms need to do one of four, sorry, all four or four different things. And then it needs to be context specific. And this is all outlined on the EEF website in the Effective Professional Development Guidance Report, if you'd like a bit more reading. So um, let's look at this first recommendation, if we may then. So I just bring up, yeah, that's what I wanted to show. Oh, oh no, actually, let's go backwards. Right. So, sorry. So, these mechanisms are the things that make the difference, according to this research that the, the EEF um, uh, commissioned and, and, and took part in. So, what it's saying, particularly here, although I might maybe I'll pause. I just I think sometimes you just need to know when to pause and stop talking, don't you? Especially when there's a slide up split attention effect. I'll stop for about twenty seconds just to just to allow you to read some of those bullet points. Twenty, and the point it's making particularly is that it's not um, 
is that what you do isn't necessarily important. Um, there are different approaches to professional development, aren't there? There's lesson study is the thing or instructional coaching is the thing. The truth is lots of things can be the thing, but what this evidence found is that how you do it in particular and these mechanisms are the things that will make a difference. So it doesn't matter what you choose necessarily, but it's, what matters is how you do it, okay? Um, more on that in just a second. This, this I like, this is the combi model, which I learned about just last year. Someone, someone told me about this and it's about behavior change and it explains how tricky behavior change can be. And I think within Send Leadership, you can be saying everyone needs to be doing this thing, either for a child, for a class, for a year group, for everybody. And it doesn't happen. And then there's the, the question you left asking is, well, why isn't it happening? Why isn't that behavior changing? And this model talks about um, one of three reasons why the behavior change might not be happening. So it could be capability. So people sort of agree with what you're saying, but don't know how to do it in practice. And they, it looks like they're being very, very stubborn, but in fact, they're just not confident with the technique. And I think we often see that around behavior, don't we? We, we sort of say, please manage behavior in this way. But if someone doesn't, um, doesn't feel confident or able, or they feel like that's a risk to their rent, the wider classroom management, they'll just send a kid out the class. And, and it's not often because they hate that child or want them to fail. It's just actually, they don't feel they have the capability to, to implement the, what you're asking them to do. It could be they have the capability, but they think your idea is nonsense. And actually they're not motivated to make that change, either because they think the change is a bad one, or they think that what they're doing already is really working. So they might not have the motivation to do the thing that you're asking them to do, or they might not have the opportunity. They might be able to do it, sort of, um, they might be capable. They might think it's a good idea, but they have a line manager or a head teacher or someone who thinks it's a terrible idea, or they just can't work it in with all the other things that they're doing. They don't have the opportunity. So I think this is a really useful model in reframing a bit how we view our colleagues and their reticence to do the thing we want them to do in terms of send. And it's not always them being stubborn. Actually, it's a bit of extra support that we need to give. Now, let me just spend a bit longer talking about these mechanisms. So, because I sort of hate that word mechanisms, because I think, well, what, 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 what doesn't mean anything of in like in on its own? But if we just sort of use mechanisms or things or whatever you're more comfortable sort of thinking of these as a professional development program, so the evidence suggests, and this is hundreds of. PD programs across education and outside of education, it says that it needs to do these four different things if it's going to be successful. So it needs to build knowledge. So if we're doing a professional development program, we need people to know more after it than they did before it, essentially. And I think that makes sense. Otherwise, it's not it's not professional development, otherwise, is it? So to develop people, there needs to be some, some, some additional knowledge that they gain after working with us than they had before. That makes sense. And it gives a couple of examples of, of what that mechanism might be. It could be that you really think about managing the cognitive load. So your PD program might not work because you're trying to essentially create um, master's level autism um, students in your hour session in September. So we need to manage that cognitive load as we would with our pupils. And it could be that you revisit prior learning. So you're really thinking about how what you're saying now builds on work that's gone before. So there's a couple of examples of mechanisms within that wider thing that needs to be done of building knowledge. The second one is motivating staff. So you don't need to do all of these things. The evidence is clear that you, it's not asking you to do all 14 of these mechanisms, my goodness, but it's saying pick one-ish from each of these four. So what are you going to do to make sure that staff are motivated to make the change that you want to. So there is evidence to suggest that if do, if goal setting happens in a um, in a session, at the end of a session, if people say this week, I'm gonna try this type of plenary with, with two of my classes, um, Friday's year seven class and Tuesday's year eight class. There's evidence to suggest that that kind of goal setting makes it more likely to happen. Equally, it's gonna be more motivating if you present information from a credible source. It's not just me making this up. It's um, this is this is why this is good information. And then the after you, you provide some kind of affirmation after progress. So you're saying, this is where we were. This is where we are now. And again, we're stopping it from being just a one-off event. We then talk about developing teaching techniques. So you need to find some way related to school-based professional development of actually helping that person to do it in reality, to have the capability to do it. And there's a range of ways to do, of doing that, aren't they? It could be through a sort of coaching model. It could be by putting people into little teams or pairs to support each other and feedback to each other about how this thing, whatever it is, is going. And it could be some modeling from you, some monitoring around school and giving feedback to colleagues. And it could be through a session where you will get people to rehearse and they can be pupils and people sort of hate that, but it is kind of useful, it seems. 
Um, and then the last a set of mechanisms really is around embedding practice. So what will you do to make sure that it's not just a one off event? So it could so providing prompts and cues. So every Monday in briefing, you're that person providing death by CBD going, don't forget this thing. I've seen some great practice over there this week. Try and do this. It could be about action planning. So actually, you might get every line manager in the school to speak to their um, line manager, I suppose, and, and to go, where are we in terms of this bit of change now? Where would we be in a month? So, but if, you know, now I'll do this, now I'll go and research this, whatever, whatever someone needs to do in order to make it a reality. We encourage monitoring, and that may be just from you, but I know there's a real focus in these set of webinars around delegated leadership. And actually, if you can work with every member of your senior leadership team or middle, leader, middle leaders, to make sure that they're doing some of this monitoring on your behalf or on the school's behalf or ultimately on the, on the children's behalf that's really going to help isn't it in terms of making it um making people able to walk that walk day to day and then prompting context specific repetition so that i can't i don't just do it in my year seven class i can now actually try it within my year 11 class or likewise early years to year three or or, or whatever's you know, the appropriate different context of your school okay so so um in summary, with these mechanisms, and this is the slide I'm probably going to spend the longest on in my um, time here, because I think it's it's totally brilliant, if I'm honest. I think it's, um, and it's not my work, so I'm not I'm not being sort of arrogant about that. But I think it's great that it goes, it's not just a one-off event. These are a really clear set of hurdles to, that, we, that we can overcome around why people might not make the change, but are actually able to do to make the change if we set it up correctly. So number one, we need to make sure that good PD makes colleagues more knowledgeable. Number two, good PD will get buy-in from colleagues that is sustained. Number three, it develops teacher techniques so that they can put the change into practice. They've rehearsed and know how to do it. And finally, it's not just a one-off event. Okay. So I hope, um, I think there's a, there's a, a real need for good for this set of sessions that Matt and colleagues from Holtzwick Centre have put on, because I think actually there's a bit of a gap in terms of, uh, you know, Senkas have enormous expertise, not always evidence informed, but sometimes evidence informed and where it is, they then shout about it potentially once and no one listens and then that, that then it dies a death but actually this helps it to be sustained i hope the final um, bit around this is about thinking about the context of your school and and thinking about actually can is this is this right is this right for where our school is at at the moment and whether your school is outstanding special measures high proportion send low proportion send urban rural there may be many fact primary secondary mainstream special there may be there will be lots of things that that say whether the thing that you want to change is right and that the timing is right including of course what the other priorities are for change at the school as well but to summarize this slide here it's about um thinking about with a professional development program what do i need to stick to absolutely originally that everyone has a coaching session every single week and what do we go? We can adapt this based on the needs of our school. So it's so there's just, I don't think there's an easy answer there, but it's just the, the process of thinking, where do I need to be strict to the, the program we've bought into and where can I, where can we make it work for our setting? Um, it's a bit about contextual appropriateness, of, th of course, so thinking about other priorities within your school. And then it's a bit about making it realistic as well. I think we've all known ourselves to be totally overwhelmed with all the bits of change that are trying to, the different leaders are trying to bring about in our school at the same time. And actually, we've got to make sure that the things we're asking of teachers are realistic and, um, and with, we are supporting them where the support is needed. Okay, so the challenge in my final slide, I think, is what the challenge I've presented today and before I hold, hand over to Kilvan in just a moment is to think what does an effective PD programme look like that will po positively influence teacher practice for SEND? And the thing that I hope some people will go away and have a think about if that is the change D that you're looking for is how those mechanisms that I've talked through might help to embed these five evidence-based approaches for students with SEND and all the wonderful work that the whole school SEND team do here um, and all the all the lots of um, it's things on the EEF website as well I hope help really busy wonderful practitioners to make that a reality and make that possible in your setting so um my um the, the, the Twitter handles of me and the Education Lab Foundation are just on this slide. And I really look forward to hearing Culver and actually is an incredibly busy and wonderful head teacher talking about putting all of this into practice day to day. So I shall hand over to you, Matt, or straight to Culver and you give me the nod and tell me what what's next. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. That was that was amazing. That was really, really uh, helpful to have such kind of a clear exposition on, you know, what those what those mechanisms are 
Uh, I know you hate that term, but uh, you know what, what you know what it is that we can do practically uh, in order to embed those strategies that are uh, where there is a really strong evidence base already that will make the, the most impact on those owners with send. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, Colvin, are you happy then to talk a little bit about how you have developed those principles and use those principles in your schools? Are you happy to start sharing your screen? Yeah, very happy. Um, I was really enjoying Gary's presentation. Um, so let me just get my PowerPoint up. Is that okay for everybody to see? Yeah, I can see that. That looks great to me. Okay, lovely. Um, what I'm going to do really, um, and I've looked through the chat, so we've got lots of Senkos, some Senkos at primary schools, Senkos at secondary schools, Senkos across more than one school, which is really interesting for me because I know the challenges of working across more than one school. Uh, what I'm going to do today is get, get you thinking a little bit about some of the some of the challenges um, that you may face at Senkos in terms of leading uh, professional learning across across your schools. I agree with everything that Gary said in terms of how powerful um, most Senkos, all Senkos are incredibly busy. Um, so when you talk about your energy management or time management, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to thank Matt, who you're going to hear next week for his term. Um, energy management is what is going to be the best use of your time and your expertise and professional development is the key. I'm going to start by just drawing on some of the things Gary said um, when he talked about, well, what is the research telling us about what effective CPD looks like? And that is really important. And by sharing those resources, uh, take some time back at school, or even I would say, maybe if you can, half of that at home and just explore those resources and start thinking about what you would like to do. The other thing he talked about is effective change. And quality change, he said, supported by practice. So first thing I'm going to tell you, quality change in terms of professional learning takes time and happens over time. Um, his slide at the beginning about emails, one-off sessions, they're like tiny little plasters. And, and, and you want to, to implement quality change over time. That, that means your professional learning that you implement should happen over time. And why are we engaging in professional development? I have a very simple perspective on this um, because I, I am, um, as a head teacher, I, I also did a doctorate, spent eight years working full time doing a doctorate. Why? Not because I wanted a doctorate, not because I just enjoyed reading, it's because I could see how engagement in research improved my practice. And why do I want to improve my practice? To improve outcomes for children. Um, and outcomes for all. And I was laughing about that with the teaching and learning lead and the inclusion lead or the teaching and learning lead and the SENCO lead. Well, for me, inclusion lead trumps everybody. The head teacher should be the leader of inclusion. The teaching and learning lead should be inclusion lead. Because what's the point of leading teaching and learning if you are not impacted upon every child? Um, the other thing that came through strongly is that I'm gonna go back to that report, reflecting on your practice every teacher as a teacher of SEM. And what I feel and my experience is the biggest challenge that SENCOs face is that everybody thinks you are the front of all knowledge, you have all the solutions, and the progress and learning for children with SEND is your responsibility. It's your responsibility to have an overview for every child in every teacher's class. We're looking at what, what um, Matt talked about, it's creating a culture and, and over, the, over the series of three sessions, I'm gonna present my case, a case study today of, of one school. Next week, I'm going through some of the nuts and bolts of how do we develop um, a truly authentic, inclusive culture in which every adult in the school takes responsibility for the learning of every child. Um, and what I mean by that is, is, is a collaborative approach so that the SENCO is the facilitator for enabling the adults to meet the needs of every child. Um, and the final bit was already talking preparing to deliver effective professional development. As a SENCO, and as I was going to the chat, I've just started, I'm a newly appointed SENCO, it can be very daunting. Um, and Gary's got it spot on, it depends upon the context of the school, how well you work with the head teacher or the CPL lead, CPD lead. 
who's coordinating that in terms of what what it is possible for you to do what i'm going to present for you today is an ideal but in reality all we are working towards is being more inclusive today than we were yesterday very small incremental steps not changing everything in a day um and I am currently a head teacher of two schools. One, I'm in my 10th year, and the other one, I'm just done two years. I've been head of a third school previously, and when I go into a school, regardless of, usually if I'm called into, into a school to head, to be head, things aren't going great, because otherwise they wouldn't be calling for me. But I always go with a plan, for a three to five year plan, and, and where schools are not successful, it is the children with the greatest needs that are, that are, are suffering the most. So inclusive practice, including inclusive leadership is central to everything. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to try and work uh, my way through in terms of everything that Matt has planned over the three sessions. So I'm just going to go back to what he's saying is the golden thread. So if you think I ever if at any point I'm going off the golden thread as participants, you can put in the chat. OK, so how do we make that happen? The other thing I'm going to say is because it's just, I love this approach of, of presenting a case study today, listening to Gary and then uh, sharing some more next week in terms of, uh, of learning focused leadership and, and developing professional learning is that you have a chance at the end of this session to, to share some questions and thoughts and challenges that I'm very happy to, to include um, in the session on the 17th. Someone did put in the chat that it's half term. Um, and it is my half term, but it, I feel you will have more, sometimes more energy in engaging in professional learning during half term than perhaps you do at the end of a school day. So what we're trying to do is we're getting you to think about how you can lead teachers in their professional development towards more inclusive practices through the distributed leadership of, of SEND. And the second bullet point on this slide, I just added literally 15 minutes before this, this session began and sent to Matt is because I, I, I wanted to get across why this is important. And what came to my mind is make the main thing the main thing. What does that mean? I'll tell you what that means. That means that all the research will tell you that the single most important factor in impacting from the quality of children, students, whatever you want to describe, learning experiences in schools is the quality of teaching. I am not the most important person in my school, the teachers are. Why? Because they are there face to face, making decisions, asking questions, giving feedback to every child. The second most important factor is leadership. So if you are the Senko and you are leading from beyond the classroom, those teachers, you are only as good as them and their practice. So the amount of time you can spend enabling the professional learning and development of those teachers that is the best thing you can do and i will share some research with you next week there's lots of research that shows that is the best way for leaders to impact upon student outcomes and at the end of the day if what we're doing isn't impacting upon student outcomes why are we doing it but it's very easy for senkos to be seen as the expert and teachers to put the needs of certain children aside not in, a, not in a negative way, but as Gary said, they may not have the confidence in meeting the, the behavioural, the social, the emotional needs, the learning needs of those children. It is more difficult, just so that you know, I, I started working in a resource provision school. It is much more difficult to assess progress of children with profound and, and multiple learning needs than it is for the average child. That is why only the most skilled teachers can enable every child to succeed. So your job is to work with those teachers to develop practice. You are not the expert. It's like I, I hear when children, uh, student teachers go to the center. Oh, I, you know, you need to help me with this autistic child. No two children with autism are the same. It's much more important to understand where that child is rather than having some sort of perceived notion of autism and what that may look like. So that's my um, my starting point. And hopefully you're thinking, yeah, yeah, we want to do this. Not as, not as straightforward, because if it's straightforward, we'd all be doing it. I'm just going to share an example of what we do. So if I'm saying that the most important thing is the professional learning of the staff, I'll, I'll let you in on something. Matt actually um, gave me some very polite feedback on my presentation, saying that people like to see some pictures 
on the slide. So I've, I've included some pictures. That is, that picture in the corner is Highlands Primary School, which is in the northeast London borough of Redbridge. Closest uh, town is Ilford, if any of you know that area. Um, and so I was appointed as head teacher in, um, in sort of Easter of 2012. Um, very pleased to be appointed head teacher because I'll let Matt in on a little secret that that is actually the school I went to as a child. Um, so I was very proud to then go back there um, as head teacher. And um, its previous inspection, very many years before, was outstanding. So I thought, oh, this is good. I'm going to become head of an outstanding school. It should, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be too difficult. Um, but late on in June of that year, um, the school was put in an Ofsted category of requiring improvement and in reality it was probably close to special measures than being good. And the reason I'm sharing that is because sometimes people can say that what you're suggesting and how you're going to develop teachers is great in an established school or a good school or an, or an outstanding school but you can't, can you really give the time and space for teachers to develop their practice if we're in a crime improvement school? I, I think you can't afford not to. So this is about you guys being brave and thinking long term, big thinking about what you want to achieve. Uh, the previous year, only 60% of children in that school achieved level four, which is even lower than what is the expected standard now. So essentially, we were sending two fifths of our children on secondary school without the requisite numeracy and literacy skills. And, and research at the time would have shown that their chances of getting five uh, a to C GCSEs, including English and Maths, would have been severely restricted. Very established leadership team, very established practices. The reason I'm saying that is that Asenka, as a Senko, you're with, working within the culture and structure of your school. And what I may suggest might be, you might be saying, that's wonderful, but how am I going to do that in my school? Those are just some of the challenges we're going to talk about and we're happy to talk through. I couldn't get the statistic now because it was so long ago, but I'm, I think it was closer to 24, 25% of children at that school at that time were, were considered uh, SEND, School Action, School Action Plus, whatever the description you had at the time. I can tell you now without even telling the future, within two years, that figure was down to just under 10% because there were children wrongly diagnosed as SEND. Um, it may be because they had English as an additional language, or they were slightly behind, or they needed to develop literary skills. What happens with that label, when children are wrongly labelled, leads to low expectations. And one of the biggest factors that impact upon children's progress is low expectations of, of learners. So when we're developing our staff, when we're looking at our staff, first thing is, I don't know the exact phrase Gary used, but what are the conditions in your, what is the culture in your school? 90% uh, plus children with English and English language. And when we're talking about that, it's not mono, um, um, monocultural, but we're talking about children from Bulgaria, Croatia, Latvia, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan. It's not a problem, but in some schools it is seen as a problem because sometimes it's equated as EAL is uh, uh, as some sort of additional need. I, I, I don't mind we use bilingual, multilingual, English and English language, but when, um, when Gary said good teaching for SEND is good teaching for all, the part of East London I come from is good teaching for children whose English isn't their first language is actually fantastic teaching for all. So it, so it stands. Okay, so that was what we did. I'm going to tell a very brief story. When I started at, at, at this school, I was in the fourth year of my doctorate. And I will talk to you a little bit about what, what, what I studied at the time, but I was introduced to workplace learning theories which argued that more learning takes place informally in a school between the adults in the school that can ever take place formally in terms of your weekly meetings after school or your five training days. So we, I looked at models of creating an environment in which everybody, and we'll talk about this more next week, everybody is, is motivated, remember what Gary said, and engaged in their own professional learning and reflective practice and, and ensuring one of the things I say is we're only successful as a child that achieves the least. So that, that criticality and curiosity to ensure that every child succeeds. So when I came in, on, in the September, when you're in a school that's rated requiring improvement, you are really lucky because you get two uh, visits per term from the school improvement partner, associate advisor, whatever you want to describe. 
rather than the one that every other school um, uh, gets. I say you're lucky, but it's a bit tongue in cheek. So just very briefly, the, the uh, school improvement partner sat me down and she, I think she probably now, looking back, she probably thought, does this guy know what he's doing? Um, I mean, if I was in that position, I'd be thinking the same thing. He said, she said to me, uh, or should I say he or she, I'll remain nameless, we'll, we'll just say she. She said to me, right, so, you know, you're requiring improvement. You've got 16 months to turn this school around. You know, what's your plan? And I said, listen, I've got a plan. It's a great plan. And she said, what's the plan? I think Gary would like the plan and it's related to the EEF uh, research, which is very important. Plans should not come out of someone's head, they should be research based. I said, I'm doing my doctorate and I know that quality change takes time and the best way I'm going to turn this school around is to really focus on teacher professional learning, teacher development. So there's going to be no judgmental lesson observations. These teachers are on their knees, um, they do not understand their craft. I'm going to give them time and space to, to make changes, trial changes to their practice, reflect on their practice, consider um, uh, reflecting upon their practice, and we're all going to focus on assessment for learning, because, because by understanding effective strategies for assessment for learning, we are going to be a better place to meet the needs of our children. So we're all going to engage with the research of Professor, Dillian, uh, Professor Paul Black and Dylan William, Everyone is going to identify, every year group, so we have three form entry, is going to identify a research question related to their context. And this is going to come from a really important contextual professional learning and development. They are going to come up with a research question. Why is that related to Gary's work? Because I'm much more motivated to re re research something if I've come up with a question with my team. And then they're going to have 12 weeks, 13 weeks of the autumn term to engage in that research, to trial changes to their practice, to consider and reflect upon the impacts of those changes on pupil outcome. And then at the end of the autumn term in December, they're all gonna come back together and we're gonna have a celebration session in which each year group is coming, going to come back with what they found out. They're gonna share those findings with me. I'm gonna put that in a, remember what I said about teaching and lead, in a policy or a, a guidance document assessment for teaching and learning which we're all going to agree with and adhere with, and it's going to be our roadmap to improvement, and we are going to be flying. Now, she looked at me after me delivering that little monologue, and she's, well, how do I put it? I think that she thought I was a bit strange because she said, that is not a good plan. You are not going to do that. What you are going to do is you're going to go into each classroom, you're going to judge each teacher, you're going to observe each teacher and give them a judgment, either grade them outstanding, good, requiring improvement or inadequate. Because uh, as I said to Matt last week, we all like being told we're inadequate once in a while, don't we? And then you're going to set them targets and you're going to come back in four weeks and you're going to see if they've met those targets. Now what I'm... <laughs> Final thing she said to me was that if you don't do that, and if the school still require improvement and you're going to get local authority advice in 16 months time, you could lose your job. And after she went, I thought to myself, wow, I love these 700 kids in that little, pit, in that little school in the corner on that nice summer's day, but I've got three young kids of my own. I can't afford to lose my job. But I did the only thing that I could do, which is completely ignore her advice and go ahead with the plan. So let's see what happened. Because in my, my idea, you've got to do what you believe in. You've got to do what's right. Because those children aren't going to say in 20 years time, yeah, I'm not doing very well in my learning, but I understand you were under pressure from Ofsted and the local authority at the time, and that impacted negatively on my learning. They're not going to say that, right? Remember that, legacy. Those children, think about your children in your school in terms of what you want them to say about you in 15 years time. So we're going to start with school culture and what I mean by that is actually our the school culture is led by our values which informs our actions. So just an example, if I'm a teacher and I don't really believe every child can achieve and certain children are higher ability and certain children are lower ability and that's just the way it is and I haven't really got high expectations for certain children and that's not my responsibility to send cook and deal with that. That is not an inclusive culture and it's that is happening 
you need to sweep into those corners of the school. So the first thing right at the bottom I'm saying for you is to no longer be the individual who is responsible for the progress of children with SEND. This is a collective responsibility. And in the best schools, everybody is responsible for inclusion. You are limited if your head teacher doesn't share that view, but nonetheless, you have your responsibility to create the conditions for learning, the shared values and the shared vision. How do you best do that practically? By what you say, how you behave, how you respond, how you react. Everything you say and do. As a head teacher, I'm modeling to every member of staff when I speak to a child, how I expect everybody else to speak to a child. How I speak to an adult, how I expect adults to respect and treat each other with respect. In the worst school environments, it is political and it's based around the needs of the adults. In the best school environments, it is high trust, it's high challenge, it's collaborative, and everything is focused around the needs of children. So uh, this is what um, Gary talked about earlier, and I've got some examples of how I want you to think about you could, how you do that. So the first one he said, summary of recommendations, is create a positive and supporting environment for all pupils without exception. I'm telling you, the, one of the schools I'm working in now, where I was called into going in two years ago, when I went in there, it, I felt tense, let alone every adult, let alone every child. So how do we create a positive and supportive environment? First of all, we model as lead learners, right? So my title in my school is not head teacher, my title is head learning leader, to focus on the learning. So as adults, we need to take responsibility of enabling these children to feel safe, to feel a sense of belonging, to feel welcome. We do that in our body language, in, in, in the way in which we listen to children who, who are having challenges. So how do we get to a sense of shared values? Yes, if you don't get the chance to do the training day at the beginning of the year, that's not easy. But shared values include, as a SENCO, challenging, and I've been in this position where I've challenged it, challenged low expectations by adults within the institution right the other thing i said to to matt is if we are only as good as the, the teachers that we teach think about recruitment and retention so the first thing is every teacher that you promote or recruit into the school is sending a message out to everybody else that this is the kind of person and the skills and the attitude and the disp dispositions that we value go back do not employ someone, do not ask a question at interview that doesn't include a focus on inclusion, right? I'll tell you the extent I went to at Highland is I made a, a relationship with the local university that I could go there and look at the CVs of every student teacher, not to pick the one that I thought was the best, just to pick any student teacher who had a particular passion or interest in inclusion because I know that they will go on to become the best teachers because they passionately believe that every child can achieve. The second one, build an ongoing holistic understanding of your pupils and their needs. I'm gonna tell you that the building blocks for developing um, quality teaching in the classroom, and it relates completely to the research that Gary shared, is teachers need an understanding of assessment for learning. Then they need an understanding of, of dialogic teaching in terms of enabling Children, uh, facilitate the children's talk, then they need an understanding of metacognition, how to develop metacognition in children. And that um, uh, uh, research guidance from the EEF in terms of developing metacogn metacognition, we have adapted this year in that second school to enable every teacher over the course of a term to begin to understand what that looks like. Structured conversations. If you, if you want to, to really reach our most challenging children, we can't wait for parents' evening and a 10-minute conversation. No, we enable every member of staff at our school to develop the skills of coaching. And in each class, two children are selected for uh, meetings between the teacher and the parent and the family during the school day of an additional hour, which we call structured conversations, okay? So that you are, because these children or these family have additional needs, you need to do more for them. You need to go over and above. I was supposed to say at the beginning that whenever I'm working with adults, 
I'm usually focusing on each Senko, obviously at the end of the, of a school day, it's Thursday, it's been a long week. You, you guys just need to relax and maybe write down three things, which I did with Gary's, that I would like to find out more about, take away with me, to think more about. Um, do not underestimate the importance of parental engagement. Where schools are not succeeding with children with SCND, that there's insufficient co-construction and insufficient communication with parents. Every school that I've worked in that has been failing, the parental engagement's been awful. So you have to work on it. Three, that's what I've already said, make the main thing the main thing. Ensure all pupils have access to high quality teaching. I'm a great believer that, um, how do I put it? The quality of teacher professional learning in schools is pretty poor, average, it's pretty poor. So how do we support that? We support that by more collaboration, moving away from teachers learning in isolation. And I will talk about this more, more next week. But how many opportunities do your teachers in your school get to engage in non-judgmental peer learning, actually going and watching other practitioners teach? Lesson study, lots of people say they do lesson study. We didn't even touch lesson study until we'd done peer learning for three years so that, that teachers were comfortable with this. And lesson study has a very specific structure and approach. The Japanese have been doing it over 100 years. Um, we seem to have think that we're experts and, and we've only been doing it for a few years. Most of what I see in most schools isn't great. So it, there needs to be a structure. I'm going to talk about collaborative action research. And that's what I'm going to focus on for sort of like the final sort of part. I've got a bit of time, I think, in terms of when we talk about research, that word is often fearful um for teachers and what i would say to you is if it's fearful make it as easy as possible you can just say to a teacher right i want you to try these three questions this week come see me at the end of the week for five minutes and tell me what was the impact that is research you don't have to do a doctorate you don't have to do a master's we support every teacher in our school we pay 60 percent towards them doing a master's but we don't make them do it opportunities for team teaching as a Senko, how much time are you spending in your office doing paperwork and how much time are you spending in the classroom with teachers actually working alongside them, making them feel safe, enabling them? Collaborative planning is absolutely essential. If you haven't got the planning right for these children, it's very unlikely the teaching is going to be right. And you put, say, for example, I know some of you might be in the one form entry schools, but where I've got a three form entry and a five form entry, I'm expecting them to all bring their ideas to the table and all feel responsible for the learning and development of uh, children with SCND across their year group. Let's take, take this away that it's the same coach responsibility, it's an individual teacher's responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility. So the four was complement high quality teaching with carefully selected small group and one to one interventions. Absolutely. Having said that, you know, I, I've been, we do our reports, annual reports mid-year, and I'm reading reports, and I can read when reports of children with SCND, when those children are engaged in the core curriculum in their classroom, because what is written about them reflects that. So any time that a child is being uh, engaging in teaching, which is beyond the classroom, is interventions, is you, we need to ask is what is the impact of that intervention on the children's engagement in their learning in the classroom, okay? And just simple stuff. You know, like I would see someone doing a reading intervention when they're doing reading in their class, when they're doing an English lesson in their class. Now, to me, that's more about actually timetabling the adults when, and it's not about meeting the needs of the children. So what is the quality of collaboration and communication between the teacher who is the lead learner in the class? How much time is the lead teacher spending with uh, children with SEND, or how often does a teacher see this teaching assistant, which we call learning coaches, handing all the responsibility to the learning coach? So in fact, the child that needs the most ex experienced and most expert teacher is spending the most time with a, a more novice practitioner, okay? And what happens is then the child becomes over-dependent on the adult. That, that also relates to the, the fifth point about working effectively with teaching assistants. And if you want, if you want to impact on all children, not only do you have high standards for professional learning for teachers, you must have the same for um, what we call our learning coaches. So they have a weekly uh, PLM professional learning meeting session 
tailored for them. Um, I also do coaching sessions in which I mix learning coaches, teachers, uh, office staff, because one of the barriers in really effective schools is people don't really have the opportunities to work in different groups. In secondary schools, they're working in their departments. They're not working across with other departments. The more opportunities you give your staff to work with people they don't normally work with, the better. So this is about the mechanisms. So these are the mechanisms that uh, Gary's talking about. So how do we build knowledge? First of all, I'm going to say to you, it's a good professional development that should make knowledge, colleagues more knowledgeable. That doesn't happen in a one hour session. That happens in enabling quality professional learning over time. The second one about motivating, I'll tell you how you motivate staff. Give them professional development that they want. And, and that seems a strange one, but anything that you ask a teacher to do that they do not understand the purpose of is inherently demotivating. And what happens in most schools is you have very hierarchical leadership structures in which staff are told what they want, need to learn and told what they need to do. Imagine a, a, a staff of empowered critical thinkers who are driving their own learning. What could potentially be the impact upon the children? The third point, very important. I, 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 I'm a big fan of action research because action research is, 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 is quite poorly regarded amongst academics, but because it doesn't, it, it's not considered, practitioner research is not considered a valid form of research. But for us as teachers, it's the best form of research because it's not focused on creating new knowledge, it's, it's focused on, um, on uh, implementing changes and improving practice. And that fourth point, bullet point I've said more than enough is that good professional development will be more than just a one-off event. What I want to do for, just for the rest of the session is just share with you what teachers say is the value of engagement in research and what, they, what schools say are the challenges and then leave you with some thoughts upon some of the activities that I would do, I would implement in the school, um, not one off, there's a multi focused approach to, to, uh, to developing a really inclusive school. So, this is what teachers say they like engaging in research because it gives them opportunities to learn and trial new strategies. We focus too much in schools on a formativity culture uh, rather than a learning culture. So teachers are often afraid of taking risks because they believe they have to perform in these lessons or get the work in the books because they're going to be judged. Actually, some of those decisions are made in the best interest of leaders and adults, not what children need. So this is about giving teachers confidence, confidence about giving them the opportunity because there's a difference between telling a teacher what to do and enabling them to understand what is the right thing to do. The second thing takes time, the first thing doesn't. They felt that by engaging in research, they improved their practice. So by having the opportunity to look at the EEF stuff, trial some metacognitive questions in, in their classroom, if they have found it has impacted upon children, they are more far, far more likely to use those strategies. One of the problems with CPD is often it isn't personalized and relevant to that particular teacher and their particular children, which is why you want your staff driving their learning. Remember, it isn't just about, I need to know about autism to meet that one child. If I have a very effective understanding of metacognitive questioning, I'm gonna impact from that child and every child. So great teaching for send is good teaching for all. You, you have early years practitioners sitting in a session which is aimed at upper key stage two. It is demotivating. So really, next time you go in a session, next time you think, is this appropriate for everyone? Is this, is this relevant to everyone? Um, they really enjoy it. The number one thing, only a couple of people have ever complained about that, but maybe they just don't want, they, they don't, don't want to be around everybody else, or they feel they know it all, is that everybody likes collaborative learning activities. So you've got a nice piece of research, take 10 minutes out and give people the time and space to read it together, okay? They see value of learning over time in the same way that Gary said. They felt that they developed the skills of reflection and self-analysis. Lo and behold, the more you take opportunities to reflect, the more reflective you become. And I'm going to go into this in more detail next week. They like the fact 
they get the opportunity to keep up with current practice. Not everybody wants to go to university to do a master's. Not everybody wants to go on Twitter and read all these blogs. Not everybody wants to read the TS. They have to go home. They've got kids to look after. They need to switch off. Make it as easy as possible for them to keep up with current practice. One thing I've done every week for however many years is I read the TS. I then ask the office to photocopy relevant articles. I put them into teacher's pigeonhole. I then ask them, what do you think? Do, what, and I'm talking, you can give out research summaries, which are two pages long, but very powerful. What happens when you engage in research and you reflect upon your practice? You become more confident, you, confident, you become more motivated, you develop a positive mindset. Here's what people said are the challenges. What are factors affect teachers learning with the need for them to be relevant and contextualized to them as an individual? What do I need in my second year to teach them? What do I need in my 10th? And also, what do I need to improve my practice with these children? Not just in case I may have a child like that in four years time. They want to be involved in selecting their own focus. Now, wouldn't it be great if the same case, everybody came up with, you to, kept with, up with their own focus for the learning and asked you to support that learning rather than fix this child. Collaboration is key. So how collaborative is the learning environment? I can see uh, Matt on my screen. Am I all right for five minutes? I'm all right for five more minutes. Yeah, five minutes, that should be fine. We've then um, got some time for questions. So if anybody does have any questions remaining uh, for Colvin or for Gary, then do just pop them in the chat or in the Q&A box. Great, thank you. Um, some problem, and you might be sitting there thinking, we can't read this in our school, is a lack of support from school leaders. All right, so I've done a doctorate, I spent my entire life looking at uh, the factors that impact on teacher engagement and professional learning. It's not unlikely that I have a better structure and focus for teacher learning, but do not be afraid to share the research and say that this is what we need to do. The other thing is, look at ideals. What type of learning environment, what type of school do you want to work in? And start developing the practices that will enable you to do that. The other massive thing is that teacher said, oh, we were doing that. And then uh, we were told that Ofsted might come and everything stopped. So we just spent our time focusing on Ofsted. There is so much guidance in, um, you know, I'm hoping Richard's not on this call, but my current um, uh, inclusion lead at the second school, he's really worried about this. And I'm telling him just to relax, do the right thing for your children, not because of what, what, you're, what we're being told that we need to do, and the other thing is, the worst thing you can do is rush strategies in without a really secure understanding for teachers on what that looks like. So take your time. Quality change takes time. So these are the big things in terms of what we did at Highlands in terms of a whole school approach. Uh, first one is related to behaviour. We are a right respecting school, but it doesn't matter if you're not a right respecting school. Is there a shared understanding of behaviour for learning? How we talk to children? how we talk to each other, what we want to achieve from our behaviour policy. If it's conformity, and if it's, if it's um, zero tolerance or uh, silent corridors, all I would ask is, and what is the purpose and what will be the impact? So we have a right to in school because we want our children to be able to move around the school freely because they respect their environment rather than they're afraid of getting in trouble for damaging the environment, okay? It is their environment. The other thing I would say is, for example, do we have low expectations for children's behaviour? So I've gone in this school in which it's the worst school in the local authority, it's been in the newspapers, children being excluded, parents complaining. Recently, Kate Green, Shadow Education Secretary visited and she was amazed by how well and independent the children moved around the school. I'll give you an example, our children from year three to year six, they come into assembly by themselves. And, and we're a five parliamentary thousand kids school. Adult is, is, is told to go to the back. Because why do you need, why do children need an adult to tell them how to walk into assembly? They can lead each other. Just an example, different type of culture. I talked about my title was head learning leader. I talked about recruitment, absolute focus, everything we do. The greatest thing I can do and the most time I can spend is supporting the professional development 
of the staff team. And next week we'll talk about what that looks like in terms of a dynamic learning community. Enabling everyone to engage in research. Committed to collaborative planning. Even if you're one from entry school, year one and year two, give them their PPA. We call them LRC. We don't call PPA, we call it learning review conversation. We want dialogue about kids, dialogue about learning, sugar paper, collaboration. Um, one thing I feel very strongly is when I first went to Highland, I had a wonderful Senko, but she looked about 10 years older than she was because she was, the, the energy was being sucked out of her within an inch of her life. So the first thing I did, because she was doing everything, she was doing the same kind of, she was responsible for all the children. All teachers did was look to her, you solve it, you're the expert. No other uh, responsibility has that association. First thing I do is say, I'm, I'm inclusion lead, that's my responsibility, and we don't leave with the same cup, we have a team. Parental engagement, I talked about, the last bullet point is that coaching is the glue that joins everything together, which is what I'm trying to describe in that slide. Coaching, every member of staff has to be developed as a coach. And I was once told you need to do a thousand hours of coaching. And I think we're going to look at this in session three. A thousand hours of coaching to be considered a coach. Why is that important? Because every member of staff changes the way in which they talk to each other, the way in which they talk to children, and the way in which they talk to parents. And everything is solution focused rather than, I think the biggest drain on Senko is everyone comes to you with a problem. So the final slide, just to give you a little flavor, if you've got half term in two weeks time and you're thinking, oh, I don't really fancy watching this session on 345, you're gonna wanna come because you're gonna wanna know more because this is the so what, right? So I disregarded the advice of the associate advisor and there's nothing there about Ofsted. If you look at our Ofsted outstanding, we don't really care about that. It's not important. It's the children that are important to me. The top bullet point, we've been awarded the Mayor of London Schools for Success Award for five consecutive years. We don't do anything to get that award. It's just given to us because every year in London, that award is given to the top 6% of schools for the greatest progress, for the lowest prior attainers, lowest on entry. Okay, So I, I'm quite proud of that because it means that the way in which we work is impacted on our most vulnerable and disadvantaged children. Yeah, we are inclusive, yeah, we are open, we have a great curriculum, dialogic teaching, but we get the heart, a really great outcome. We don't narrow, we don't teach to the test. This is about having great teachers. As a leader, working with a team of, like I said, of informed, reflective, critical thinkers, it isn't difficult. Just an example, we haven't had external data for a while. 87% of children in 2018 achieved expected standard of reading, writing, and math skills stage two. Those are the same brothers and sisters of the 60% or the 40% that were failed. And do not forget that in terms of our legacy. 12 teachers have completed the masters, further 10 or in fact are doing so. Three are doing the second masters, two have started the doctorate. And the final point, which, you know, should blow leaders' minds away is that we've spent, we were a crime recruitment school in now nine and a half years, we've spent £28 on recruitment, retention and, and advertising. And I think uh, Matt Silver, what was that £28 on? It was an advert for um, a member of our office team. The reason I'm saying that is that people want to work at our school. We attract the most inclusive teachers um, and we haven't got enough space for all the people that want to work there. I'm sure I probably took more time than I was supposed to, but I did ask politely about six minutes ago, so I'm, I'm, I'm okay. So I'm going to stop share, Matt, and mute and hand over to you. Thank you. No, that's, you don't need to mute. It's absolutely fine, Calvin. No, I really appreciate that. And it's, it is really helpful to hear your experiences of, of, con of contextualising the, the, prin the, the principles that Gary spoke really clearly uh, about um, at the beginning. Um, uh, I mean, I, I am totally blown away by, by both presentations, really. Um, I, I think that uh, one of the, um, the elements that, that has really resonated with, with me is, is that, that, that whole idea of, of how, how you lead the, the professional development of others in a way that they can really receive it when they are doing a stressful job, they are tired. How can you um, promote conversation between 
different people between different roles what are the barriers um and and i'm i'm conscious in my own experience even in a school where where there is a strong culture of uh, of of group reflecting on on and, and lear professional learning that uh, there are things that i can do to make it easy for people in the same way that i would uh, if i was in the classroom you know um, present you know if, I, if i'm going to introduce something new how am i breaking it down into a sequence how am i uh, giving lots of different ways in which people can um can access it and engage with it and talk about it how am i giving time within a, a curriculum workshop uh, to actually read uh, read something that i that, that that's introducing something new and then create the space for, for a conversation around it um, so it's, it's really helpful to get such um, such rich stories from you about how you've managed to transform your school and create uh, this dynamic learning community. Um, we've got some questions coming through. Uh, I've got lots of people saying that saying thank you. I'm conscious that lots of schools they lock the doors at five o'clock, and so I think there's a few people who've had to leave. Um, but hopefully we'll be able to um, to join us next time. There 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 is a question in the chat, and then I'll come to the rest of the panel if that's okay. So. Um, this is this is to Calvin or to Gary or to anybody uh, on the line in, on the panel, if that's OK. Lorraine asks, do you think that the teacher standards fully reflect the need to teach inclusively? Um, this has been this is this has major impact on teacher training and early career teachers upwards. Um, I, I don't mind talking about that, Matt, because I I'm currently running our own little ECT program, so I get to work with the ECTs and Get to do lots of these activities and get them to really think about it. Firstly, there's lots of people who think a standards model cannot be applied to a profession like um, education because you, you can't put behaviour separate to uh, questioning. So, so I think it's a clunky approach, um, and I think that the the the, the training program for ECTs is stretched in terms of meeting tick boxing those standards, and I think inclusive practice or uh, practice in terms of supporting children who, whose first language is English or things like metacognition, they just fall off, off the end because they're a little bit more complex. So in answer to the question, I think, I think it could be a lot better. Um, and I think that would help because it, 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 a lot of ECTs struggle with understanding more inclusive practice. Mm. No, that's that's really helpful. Um, I'm conscious. I'm I'm also involved locally. You know, when there are people with a real heart for inclusion that are leading those conversations um, and and supporting um, ECTs in particular at the moment to look at something and then and then consider it from the point of view of children with SEND. I think that really makes a difference. Um, Gary, did you want to come in? Yeah, just as always with these things, and the, the success is in the delivery, isn't it? You know, I, I don't think that the teacher standards prove and. Um, prevent um inclusive schools from for and, and early career teachers from learning a craft that is really inclusive i don't think it guarantees it nor does it prevent it it's in the the ethos of the people who are delivering it and clearly if you're lucky enough to have colvin involved in your early career you're going to be someone who's brought you know welcomed into the um profession as a really inclusive teacher i do like the the adaptive teaching as an ethos i think the move away from differentiation which let's not let's not pretend that that's an awful thing and let's not pretend that everything that went before is horrible because that's clearly and um, stupidly oversimplifying the, the thing but to start not with difference and differentiation but to start with I teach my lesson and it's got to be for everyone and I adapt accordingly based on how students are doing today this week this month this year rather than going different that's your autistic off you go and you need this because you're dyslexic so I think although I'm you know horribly oversimplifying the difference between the two I think the move to adaptive teaching is a helpful one but the um the devil's in the detail I suppose or the devil's in the delivery in this case yeah, and I, I, you... just to add to Gary is that the most powerful thing in terms of adapting teaching is to actually get people, get teachers to move away from what I want to achieve in this hour to what I want to achieve over the next three weeks, the next six weeks. Because what happens then is you, you let the children lead and you're much more adaptive to what has happened in the previous session. And like John Hattie talks about, share with the children what we're aiming for and then get them thinking about actually your learning is taking place over time rather than their learning objective for this lesson and if you don't get that that's, that's absolutely fine and I, I do feel that teachers are often under a lot of pressure as well 
to get something in their books or to demonstrate what that learning looks like and, and to, to, to provide these neat lessons. When I, I would think, just switch off and think, what do I want them to achieve by the end of this two weeks in this unit? And, mm. and take the time and space and let them make mistakes, let them trial changes, let, let them lead it and, and be, be in charge. And the metacognition, metacognition stuff that the EF produced is brilliant, but it's very powerful. Well, Catherine, you look like you were leaning in to uh, comment as well on that one. I was just going to say about the teacher standards. It's, it's also really important that we don't see inclusive teaching as teacher standard five. And it's thinking about all of the standards, how we're meeting the needs of all children. Um, it's really important that as we're thinking about teaching standard two or six, you know, send runs through all of it. So not just thinking that, OK, I'm adapting my teaching. That's it. Because it's actually thinking about all of the principles of teaching and how we're meeting the needs of children with SEND in every lesson or in, in every environment within the schools, not even within the classrooms, but during those unstructured times and things like that, how we're developing that effective provision. Oh, thank you. Becky, did you want to comment on that, comment on, on that yeah. one? Yeah, I um, I, I really, put, really um, enjoyed both of your presentations so much. Thank you. Um, I was interested in that point you were just talking about, Colvin, and um, Gary as well, about adaptive teaching. And I absolutely agree with the value of collaborative planning and enabling teachers to kind of work together on their planning. How, what are your top tips for marrying up kind of collaborative planning where you're really looking at kind of the curriculum and your next steps and all that sort of thing, along with adaptive expertise and adaptive teaching for the children in your class? I, I would say that they're the, the one and the same. So, what, what, but what you've got to do, if you go into a school like I am right now, and, and the teachers aren't used to it, you, you, what, I, what I've adopted is like, rather than, I've got into a school where there's a head, two deputies, five assistant heads, that, that's all been removed, and I've just got what I call leadership coaching, and they go to the planning, and they model for people the kinds of questions that need to be considered, and it starts from an inclusive approach. What do we want to achieve? So what do we, how do we need to adapt that for, and I've got, I've got a child in my mind, how are we going to adapt that for her? And what we want to be is we want to be as inclusive as possible. So she should only be leaving the classroom if it's for a specific intervention that enables her to be more, better included. So it, it's not natural, but what I find is the bigger the group within the collaborative planning, some, some teachers don't like it. They want to go, you plan the English, you plan the math, let's get it down, boom, I'm, go, I'm a free bird. Not in a horrible way, but it has to be modelled. And, and that comes from a development of understanding of what the research is telling us. So you know, you'd be very welcome to come along and meet one of the leadership coaches and sit there in the planning session, because it seems like we haven't done anything. Yes, we have. We've, we've done the dialogue. You can fit the, fit the pieces in after. The dialogue, professional dialogue is so powerful and the reason I say that is because no teacher is perfect no leader is perfect so I'm still curious about learning and I want everybody else to be curious about learning and know that you might get it wrong and that's okay because long term like what Gary said over the course of the year those children are going to make better progress because you've thought really carefully about what they need and how you adapt it and listen to the children ask them what they you know what they think that they want to do or what they need to improve on that's metacognition the only thing I'll add to that, if that's um, OK, is to for what should that conversation be about? And obviously that collaborative planning is is you could you could plan everything. You know, you could try and cover everything. I think the one thing that's absolutely needed is to separate within what we're teaching here. What will everyone get and what is aspirational? And to know that not everyone will get everything from every lesson because students learn at different rates and in different ways. But actually, if you can separate yourself as a teacher, and obviously I'm speaking to Senkos who are, who are trying to lead professional development for teachers, it's about going, what is absolutely foundational and everyone's going to leave with this? And what's aspirational and not everyone will get that? And that's OK. But it means that if adaptive teaching is to work, I think that you need to know that um, I don't wait till everyone gets everything before I move on, because that then, you know, you've got students of all different abilities and levels in the class. But actually, everyone needs to be able to get something meaningful from your one lesson. And so it's about you knowing what's absolutely foundational. I'll give everyone the access, the chance to learn everything. 
but knowing that not everyone will get everything and that that's okay and so as a teacher just separating in your mind i think what do i expect to be a bit easier and accessible for everyone and what do i expect to be aspirational and some will get there others won't i won't put a ceiling on who i'm allowing to get there but i know that i'm okay with not everyone will get this um just yet and that's all right yeah and you're talking that's there really about really, that's really sorry, really Carmen, up to you Come sorry. On, Sorry, Matt, I'm just going to say it's a really good point. And if I illustrate in that in practice where I've been into a lesson where a teacher has taught the, the, what would be the core content, adapted questioning, whatever, sent them off to the table, kept one group back on the carpet because they're, 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 they're a different um, personalized what they're going to do, adapted it, got them on back on a table and brought another group back just because they're thinking about and i get what gary said the, the plan can't be so prescriptive and also it can't be too demanding it has to start from where the children are at within a wider frame it has to take what vygotsky talks about zone of proximal development or more experienced other is actually you want each child to be making progress not just be at the same at the mm. same stage yeah and i think i think um I think in terms of leading the professional development of, of, a, of a diverse teaching team, you are going to have teachers who are all going to be at different starting points, aren't you? When you're, when you're thinking, actually, these are the fundamentals that I need, uh, that I, you know, my vision is that, 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 that all teachers will have these fundamentals going on in their classroom and, and existing in their, in their planning. Um, but actually, there, there are some who've got capacity to... Uh, to lead their own learning in, in a different way and to, to, to become our, my champions for what the the next thing the next innovation might be and and how how you kind of utilize that uh, that diversity uh, and make use of those who who of those teachers who you know do seem to be showing that that motivation and that capacity to develop themselves um, even further um Catherine did you have any uh, questions or any comments uh, from from this, the webinars tonight no, just thinking back to actually uh, a really good takeaway, I thought, and something I'm going to be sharing with uh, Senkos within my trust is one of the first slides that Gary showed, um, where you're thinking about how you're leading send CPD in your school, if it's an email or if it's a one-off or if it's a tug of war. I see that as a really good resource for Senkos to bring to their head teachers to talk about, you know, this is how I'm feeling about send CPD. This is where I would like it to go. Um, maybe it's the teacher and me bringing it back to visuals to say, you know, this is really where I feel like we're operating. How can we get to here? And that can be a really um, useful resource. I mean, just to echo what Becky said, I really enjoyed um, both of the, the presentations today, and I'll definitely be bringing the learning back to, uh, to the trust that I'm working at. So thank you to you both. Well, um, we've just had one question, one last question from, from Chloe. Um, just, just clarifying, we've, we've had subject specific planning sessions at staff meetings and all have had input on each other's units. Would this be classed uh, as an example of collaborative planning? I, I, I would say, yes, it is an example of collaborative planning, but the power is if it's happening regularly. Because, I, I, you know, in every teaching team, what, what we talk about is the diversity of thinking within the team. So like even if it's three people or two people that actually it's going to be better than what a person can produce by themselves and that that is important that that time is used to be thinking more deeply about what do our children need next so all collaboration is good within the spirit if people are motivated to, to do it so that that i think is the key any opportunities for collaboration rather than working in isolation take it the research will tell you it is powerful and I think what you've both shown is that even even when you have you have got aspects of of collaboration, you've got aspects of uh, of a dynamic learning community. That there's always more that you can do, isn't there? And um, you know, I, I I feel really fortunate to be in a school where I feel we do have a dynamic learning community, and that that hasn't happened by accident. That's happened through um, very conscious decision making to, to to get it that way, and a lot of hard work. But we're still constantly con consciously and consistently thinking about how we can improve it. And just last week, we were talking about um, our observation our observation um, structures and. And actually, how how is it that we can ensure that the people who need to observe the most get an opportunity? You know, why is it always senior leadership team? Why is it always um, uh, middle leaders, curriculum leads, only observing their own subject? 
you know, I asked our, our creative and expressive lead when, when the last time she had observed another class that wasn't a creative and expressive subject. You know, we constantly have to challenge uh, our, our own assumptions and our own status quo in, in these things in order to um, continually improve and enhance that, that dynamic learning environment. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's never static, is it? No, for real. Okie doke. I think that's everything on the on the chat. I'm just checking. There's nothing else in the Q and A's. I don't think that I have missed that we've missed anything. I think we've answered questions as we've gone. Um, but we we are excited to have uh, Colvin back uh, on the 17th, and we'll be joined then by by Dr. Matt Silver too. Um, so hopefully, if 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 we have missed anything. Uh, do let us know and we can ensure that we can uh, build that into the next session. Um, but I'd really like to thank uh, Gary and Colvin for, um, for their, their presentations tonight. It's been really thought provoking and there was an awful lot of love coming through the chat to you both uh, saying thank you. Uh, and, Thanks um, everyone for their time. Really, sorry, Matt. Thanks everyone for the time. It's, I appreciate it's late and you know people have had a hard, hard long day. So, so really thank you for your time and attention. Good. Thanks, All right. Well, Take care of everybody and we will see you soon. Bye.